Well, thank you for attending the session on pulmonary function testing, uh, a case-based overview I will be presenting today. I have no disclosures, and our agenda will really be to cover the major pulmonary function tests, including spirometry, which is our gold standard test for measuring airflow, and really a screening for restrictive lung disease. We will review briefly lung volume measurements, which is the only test capable of defining whether restriction is present in pulmonary function, and a review of gas exchange or the DLCO. And it is essentially the only measure of the gas exchange properties of the lung. And a brief review on respiratory muscle strength testing, often known as maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressures or MIPS and MEPS. We'll spend the most time on spirometry since it's the most used pulmonary function test and by far the most valuable. Spirometry is really predicated on an adequate maneuver. And the maneuver is really depicted graphically here where a patient is asked from tidal breathing in this phase to take a deep breath in like this, all the way in to total lung capacity and exhale as quickly as possible so flow measurements are meaningful, all the way out until their chest is empty and can move no more air and that's really at the functional residual capacity and residual volume. And exhalation is done to residual volume, and the exhale volume is the force vital capacity, or FVC. And that's really the core of spirometry and its maneuver. When interpreting spirometry, the most important thing to do is look at the graphics first. I think most of us are tempted to look at the numbers, which we will do and are important, but the graphics really tell the story. There are two graphics that are most valuable. Volume exhaled over time, a very primitive measurement, uh, but is quite informative. Uh, most of us have learned that the forced exhalation time should be at least six seconds, but honestly, as long as there is plateau of flow as there is here, even starting at three or four seconds, the lungs have emptied and it's a reasonable effort, non-disruptive flow pattern. And you could tell that this lung has largely been emptied after um, three or four seconds. So it's a good effort. As opposed to this volume versus time curve, where volume is coming out well after exhalation and even out at six or seven seconds. And the slow emptying the lung represents poor flow. And this is a, a, a pictorial representation of an obstructed patient in volume time curve. Volume time curve on an actual pulmonary function test is shown here. And this is the second graphic, or the flow on the y-axis versus volume on the x-axis, also a critical graphic that we look at. And together, they really represent all the data you need to know in spirometry. And in a flow versus volume loop, we're looking at inhalation towards the machine as the reference down to zero. Volume goes from uh, uh, the maximum volume inspired down to zero. And then we look at flow on exhalation, forced out. This is peak expiratory flow right here. And then post-peak flow continues all the way down until flow stops. And when flow stops, the maximum exhale volume is depicted on the x-axis. In this case, approximately 3 liters or 3.4 liters. So since the normal expected Vo exhale volume and flow is depicted in a dotted line or predicted, we could see that this flow pattern and this exhale volume or FVC is essentially normal. So we would expect looking at the volume versus time curve and the flow volume loop in this PFT that the metrics on spirometry are going to be normal. And we've derived this just by looking at the flow volume loop and the volume time curve. If we go ahead and look at the numbers that come out of this flow volume loop, we in fact confirm normal values. So the FEC is 3.37, 103% of the mean, far above the 95, well, lower 95% confidence interval. And the FEV1 is 2.4, 97% of the mean, and well above the lower 95% confidence interval. And the FEV1 to FEC ratio is normal at 72%. And in fact, you should exhale in one second at least 70% of your um, total FVC, which is how a normal ratio of 70% is, der is derived from FV1 over FVC. So this is a normal spirogram and spirometry with normal flows and normal exhaled FVC. If we go on to another example, we see the volume time curve 
not quite plateauing, even at an exhalation time of eight seconds, which indicates that there's some resistance to flow and some slowing of flow. So this right away suggests possible obstruction. And then when we look at actual flow rates versus exhale volume, we see that the defect here is really in peak expiratory flow versus predicted. And this coving or flattening of post-peak flow airflow far off from the flow we would expect of four, five, six liters per second. The peak flow here is only three liters per second, and the post-peak flow is very slow. Although the force vital capacity is pretty normal, almost at the predicted value of three. So the defect here is not in poor inhalation and exhalation of volume, but the flow rate of, inhal of exhalation. So this is already suspicious for obstructive lung disease. So when we look at the numbers, the FEC is in fact 2.69, 92% of the mean. The FEV1 is 1.09, 46% of the mean, and very well below the 95% confidence interval. And the FEV1 to FEC ratio is only 0.41 or 41%. Remember, obstruction is defined by 0 0.7 or less FEV1 to FEC ratio. So this is very severe obstruction um, with a uh, low FEV1. We will pause here for a minute to help define what's normal, because we see both a percent predicted and a 95% confidence interval. And we really are defining normal as any value above the lower 95% confidence interval. Uh, but we use percent predicted or percent of the mean to score severity of uh, defects, obstruction, or restriction. And we do this because certain variables, like DLCO, for example, have a very wide normal uh, distribution. And a patient can be less than 80% of the mean, but still above the 95% confidence interval. And so we do not want to score people abnormal just because that particular PFT variable is very widely distributed in the population. Whereas a value like FEC, which tends to be more tight around the mean, most patients who are um, uh, below 80% of the mean are, are outside the 95% confidence interval. And that's how we use the 95% confidence interval versus uh, percent of the mean. When we grade obstruction, we use uh, this type of gradation model of mild, moderate, moderately severe, very severe based on the percent of the mean or percent predicted of the FEV1. And you can refer to this as a reference. So back to the cases, which is really where the, the highest yield here is. This is a, another example of a, a, a spirometry that can sometimes fool us. Here is the obstructed spirometry I put up uh, as a reference. And here is the patient, uh, in this case, flow volume loop. So we see inhalation here, exhalation here. And notice how the FVC or the exhale volume is fairly close, if not on, the, the predicted exhale volume of approximately three liters. But the peak expiratory flow rate is much lower at three liters per second versus six liters per second. And the peak flow doesn't really change. It sort of truncates and is very flat almost non-physiologic. And then as volume is almost all emptied, there's a little bit of return to curvy linear flow. And if we looked at the numbers from this spirometry, the FVC is in fact normal, 100% of the mean. The FEV1 is in fact normal at 2.06, 88% predicted. And the ratio is nearly normal at 68%. So if we just looked at these three values, FEV1, FVC, FEV1 over FVC, we would call this basically normal spirometry. But on visual, the flow volume loop is glaringly abnormal. And that's picked up when we look at the peak expiratory flow rate of 3.07, 50% of normal. So the main defect in this PFT is a flat plateaued peak expiratory flow rate and that alone. So when we see a peak expiratory flow rate that's flattened and out of proportionally lower than the FEV1, that's a red flag for a fixed large airway obstruction or a central airway obstruction. And this is, in fact, this patient's uh, upper laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy, where there's severe subglottic tracheal stenosis from an old inhalational injury on this patient. And just to review the patterns of central or large airway obstruction, this patient actually had flattening on inhalation and exhalation, which is a fixed large airway obstruction. This example has strider or collapsing of the airway on inhalation only, but blowing open of the airway on exhalation. So this is a variable extra thoracic large airway obstruction. This patient has free, easy airflow on inhalation, but then obstructs on 
more centrally in their airway on exhalation. And this is a variable intrathoracic uh, lesion. Moving on, we see an interesting spirometry uh, here where we have a volume time curve that nearly plateaus, but maybe slow airway emptying. And on the volume flow volume loop, we have a reduced peak expiratory flow rate, a sort of brisk reduction in flow, and an FVC that is well below the predicted FVC, way out here on the volume uh, curve. So both flow and volume do seem to be off here. And when we look at the spirometry values, the FVC is 1.03, 42% of predicted, and the FEV1 is 0.48, 23% of predicted, very low. And in fact, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is obstructed at 47%. So obstruction is clearly present here. We have a reduced FEV1 to FVC ratio, a reduced FEV1, severely reduced at 23% of the mean. So the question here is, is the patient obstructed? Yes. Are they restricted? Possibly because of low FVC. Or are they not restricted and this is all obstruction? And this is where spirometry falls short and lung volume testing is necessary. Because we don't know at the end of this FVC maneuver at residual volume, whether the residual volume is up here and all this gas is trapped and this patient actually has normal TLC or a high TLC with just severe gas trapping, or whether they're shifted down here and obstructed, but they're breathing down to a very low residual volume. So the, in essence, when the FEC is reduced, all we really need to know is whether the residual volume at the end of the FEC maneuver or FRC uh, is high, low, or neutral. And that really will define whether the person has co-restriction, obstruction, or both. And this is really the principle of lung volume testing. We have many ways, I will go back for a minute. We have many ways of uh, measuring FRC and RV with nitrogen washout, helium dilution, and body plethysmography, which is the most accurate. And for time purposes, I will skip those comparators today. But rest assured that the PFT lab will generally pick body plethysmography or helium dilution. So in this patient that we just reviewed with severe obstruction, but a reduced FEC, we performed lung volume testing and found that the TLC is in fact normal at 104% of the mean at 4.38 liters, but that the FRC and RV are markedly elevated. So when this patient finished their FEC maneuver, they had 3.7 liters of gas left in the chest. That's 234% of the mean, well above. So this patient has profound gas trapping with a normal TLC. So this patient has only obstructive lung disease, no restrictive lung disease. When we do find restriction, there are many mechanisms of restriction that could be present, including parenchymal scarring or lung scarring, such as we might see with pulmonary fibrosis, respiratory muscle weakness, uh, like we might see with ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or chest wall restriction like we would see with severe pleural fibrosis or skeletal abnormalities such as uh, severe scoliosis. Here's an example of a patient with a flow volume loop here that shows a reduced peak flow but a very low FVC. And in fact, the FVC is only 35% of predicted. The FEV1 is symmetrically reduced at 37% predicted. And the FV1 to FC ratio is in fact a little high, suggesting rapid airway emptying. Restriction is defined by the TLC being low, and the TLC is in fact 46% of the mean or 2.29 here. The FRC and RV are low normal, but still relatively preserved compared to the TLC and above the 95% confidence intervals. So this pattern is one of low FVC, reduced TLC, defining restriction, and relative preservation of the FRC and RV. When we do assessments for respiratory muscle strength, we find that the maximum inspiratory pressure being pulled here is only 15 centimeters of water. That's severely impaired. And the maximum expiratory pressure is only 30, 27% uh, of predicted. So very prominent muscle weakness. And so this is a pattern of uh, respiratory muscle weakness, and in fact, this patient has amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and bilateral diaphragmatic weakness. And the relative preservation of FRC and RV is a reflection that breathing out to FRC is a passive set point, not an active process, defined by the elastic recoil of the lung inward and the chest wall outward, which doesn't involve a lot of muscle strength, 
And that's why there's relative preservation of FRC and RV in a pattern of restriction by respiratory muscle weakness. We will then move on to uh, diffusion capacity and uh, gas exchange in the lung. And we have many measures of uh, indirect measures of gas exchange, such as oxygen saturation, um, arterial blood gases looking at PaO2. But that really is, a, those numbers are affected by many variables, not just diffusion of oxygen across the alveolar capillary membrane. So we use a tracer gas to look at this process of inhaling a tracer gas and it being transmitted across the alveolar capillary membrane into a red blood cell. And the diffusion of carbon monoxide is great to measure because it is very uh, efficient and avidly binds hemoglobin and really is a great tracer gas for um, oxygen and is metabolically inert. And the diffusion of any gas across the membrane, particularly CO or oxygen in this case, is really defined by the surface area or A, the diffusion constant, which is known for CO, and inversely proportional to the thickness of that process that might be uh, affected in diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis. And so the DLCO is what we're measuring, uh, of what we're deriving, and we know the partial pressure of CO, and the, we're measuring the flux of CO in and out of the lung uh, with a CO sensor at the patient's mouth. And so this is our uh, derived measured variable. And these are the units for DLCO, which are not terribly important, other than it's a flux of CO measured as milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury. And so that's the principle of the DLCO maneuver. Here's an example of how we might apply it in a previous patient we reviewed with severe obstruction, low FEV1, low FEC, low FEV1 to FC ratio, but normal TLC and prominent gas trapping. This patient has a DLCO of only 10.6, 41% of the mean, and still well below the 95% confidence interval. So this DLCO is reduced. Folks always ask, do you look at the DLCO corrected for hemoglobin, corrected for alveolar volume, which is essentially a surrogate measure of total lung capacity. And really what we should be looking at and defining a DLCO is whether it's normal, high, normal, or low when corrected for hemoglobin, if we have the hemoglobin. Because if it's very reduced and the person's anemic, it may be reduced simply on the basis of anemia and not be a reflection of impaired gas exchange at the alveolar capillary membrane. So if you know the hemoglobin, really decide whether the DLCO was low based on the DLCO corrected for hemoglobin. If not, then you take the value that you have. DLCO corrected for alveolar volume can be important adjunct information, but is not how we decide whether a DLCO was low or not. So if the DLCO corrected for alveolar volume is normal, but the DLCO is reduced, the DLCO is reduced, except that it might correct for alveolar volume. That could suggest that the patient's remaining lung does not have significant diffusion impairment and is quote unquote non disease. Uh, and that might be true for um, respiratory muscle weakness or a pneumonectomy where the lung parenchyma is preserved. Unfortunately, that relationship is not solid. So we really define the DLCO as reduced or not based on uh, DLCO or DLCO corrected for hemoglobin. So this patient has emphysema with obstruction, gas trapping, and a low DLCO, and emphysema des destroys the alveolar capillary units. In our remaining 10 minutes or so, I wanna run through three pulmonary function test cases that pull together a lot of the concepts that we've been reviewing, and a bonus topic, looking at exhaled nitric oxide or exhaled uh, uh, gas analysis. So case one is a 69-year-old female with a 40-pack year history of tobacco use and three years of progressive shortness of breath. She has no cough, sputum, and wheeze, or chest pain and no significant comorbidities. Otherwise, she's been quite active. Here's her volume time curve, which looks normal and even plateaus after four or five seconds. And her flow volume loop. Now you're experts. You can see that peak flow is normal. Flow is normal all the way through to FVC. And the FVC is going to be normal because here's the predicted FVC. And in fact, if we look at her values, the FEC is 3.37, 103% of the mean. The FEV1 is 2.41, 97% of the mean. And the FEV1 to FEC ratio is normal at 72%, so normal spirometry. And her lung volumes are normal. TLC is 5.06, 91% of the mean. FRC is 2.49, and RV is normal uh, and above the 95% confidence interval. So we have normal mechanics here with normal flow, normal spirometry, and normal lung volumes. However, her DLCO corrected for her hemoglobin is only 
44% of the mean, well below the 95% confidence interval. And even for fun, her DLC over, over VA corrects to well below predicted at 2.49 or 59% of the mean. So this is an isolated, reduced diffusion impairment with no restriction to suggest fibrosis and no obstruction to suggest emphysema. So which of the following processes are least likely present in this patient with an isolated reduced DLCO? Anemia, if we didn't know her uh, hemoglobin would be fair. Interstitial lung disease, asthma, pulmonary vascular disease. So being least likely. So which one of these would not be expected to reduce your DLCO? Anemia would, interstitial lung disease would, pulmonary vascular disease would, but asthma should not reduce your DLCO. There's no alveolar capillary destruction. So asthma is the answer. That's least likely to affect the DLCO. And when you have an isolated reduced DLCO, it suggests anemia, pulmonary vascular disease, or processes that balance any obstruction and restriction. So for example, combined emphysema and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And in fact, this is her chest CT scan, where we have pretty profound upper lobe central lobular emphysema with all these lucencies and lower lobe subpleural scarring and traction bronchiectasis, which was her new process of evolving pulmonary fibrosis. So both of these processes, emphysema and pulmonary fibrosis, impair your diffusion capacity. And she became progressively breathless and hypoxemic, but didn't demonstrate restriction from pulmonary fibrosis because she had balancing hyperinflation from emphysema and didn't demonstrate significant hyperinflation or obstruction from emphysema due to the lung volume reducing properties of pulmonary fibrosis. So this is what we call balancing mechanical physiology, but both diseases affecting uh, oxygen diffusion and DLCO. In case two, we have a 42 year old man with a history of possible asthma, presenting with two years of progressive dyspnea, cough, and intermittent wheeze, no significant comorbidities, and no tobacco history. This is his volume time curve, which plateaus after seven seconds. And this flow volume loop shows both a reduced peak expiratory flow rate and some suggestion at late lung volumes of plateauing or uh, uh, curvy linear reduction in flow. And the FEC is well below predicted. The FEC here should be almost 4.8 liters, and here it's two liters and a little bit more. So when we look at his numbers, we find that exactly. His FEC is low at 2.1, 44% of mean. FEV1 is low at 1.36, 35% of mean. And the FEV1 to FEC ratio is reduced at 65%. So we know right here that the patient has obstruction, but we want to know whether the FEC being low is from obstruction and hyperinflation, like our emphysema case, or whether there is um, uh, concomitant restriction. And in fact, the TLC is 3.92, 59% of the mean, and the FRC is relatively preserved and the RV is relatively preserved, which is probably the gas trapping that occurs when he exhales, but that does not negate the fact that he is restricted. So both obstruction and restriction are present in this patient. Moreover, the DLCO was markedly reduced at 8.76, 28% of the mean, well below the 95% confidence interval, and even as low when you correct for alveolar volume. So this patient has obstruction, restriction, and a severe diffusion impairment. So which of the following diagnoses is most consistent with these combined defects in PFTs? Pure emphysema, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, pure asthma, or sarcoid. And emphysema would be expected to cause hyperinflation, not restriction. Our pulmonary hypertension should not affect lung volumes and cause obstruction. Asthma would not cause restriction. So sarcoid by default is the right answer. And here is his chest CT scan, where we see very intense peribronchial fibrosis. This is the parenchymal disease causing restriction. There's also endobronchial involvement of the sarcoid, which is accounting for sarcoid-related obstructive lung disease. So obstruction comes from endobronchial sarcoid and restriction from parenchymal sarcoid. And you can't see it in this image, but he also had evidence of pulmonary hypertension and echocardiogram. So a pulmonary vascular disease related to sarcoid. All three compartments, the airways, the parenchyma, and the vasculature affecting his diffusion capacity in DLCO. And our last case is meant to review the concept of exhaled gas analysis, which we can now do in the pulmonary function lab. And this is a 52-year-old female with five years of cough and chest tightness. Spirometry is normal to date when checked spotty on assessments. Her labs, though, revealed peripheral eosynophilia, 
So the next best steps might include start empiric albuterol and high dose inhaled fluticasone, B, perform a methylcholine challenge to try to confirm bronchial reactivity and asthma, C, no action since spirometry is normal, D, measure exhaled nitric oxide level, or E, B, perform a methylcholine challenge, um, or D, perform uh, an exhaled nitric oxide level. And really, B or D is an adequate next step, but with evidence of peripheral eosinophilia, we might expect to see airway eosinophilia. And exhaled nitric oxide is a great marker of airway eosinophilia. In fact, it is really derived in the breast only from airway eosinophils. And in, this was performed in her. It's a very inexpensive, freely available office test and test in the PFT labs. And her exhaled nitric oxide level was 75 parts per billion. That may not mean much to you, but that is quite elevated. So on the next slide, I will review the guidelines here. So if you do obtain ex exhaled nitric oxide testing in your PFT lab, it could be very diagnostic of eosinophilic airways disease if greater than 50, and hers was 75. 25 to 50 is equivocal, and less than 25 is negative. If you look at a receiver operator curve of patients with exhaled nitric oxide level versus response to inhaled corticosteroids, which is a great eosinophil treatment, um, greater than 47 to 50 is uh, predictive of an eosinophilic response to corticosteroid therapy, and this patient was well above that threshold. Exhaled nitric oxide levels should guide asthma therapy, but should not be used alone to guide asthma therapy or diagnostics. It's likely an effective marker of medication compliance and eosinophilic asthma, although other measures of asthma control, including symptom scores and FEV1, are, are adequate. In pregnancy, the use of exhaled nitric oxide levels may decrease asthma exacerbations and use of oral corticosteroids. And in the absence of obstruction and in chronic cough, there's an entity of eosinophilic bronchitis, where patients have eosinophilic tracheobronchial inflammation, but no overt obstruction and no overt bronchial reactivity. And exhaled nitric oxide level will be elevated here and can prove useful for the diagnosis of this entity of chronic eosinophilic bronchitis and chronic cough. Thank you for your attention.